Hey, hey, welcome to Sketchy EBM. My name is Anthony Crocco, and today we're talking about patient identification, which some people call client identification. If you work in healthcare, I'm willing to bet that at some point you've heard the term patient identification. You may have asked yourself why this is so crucial in your line of work. One way to answer this question is to think about what happens when a patient is misidentified while we're caring for them. So let's imagine for a minute that our patient, Mr. Wrong, is given the wrong care activity, which could include a test or a procedure or an intervention or a disposition. The most severe and important outcome that can result from the wrong patient receiving a care activity not intended for them is actual physical harm. We should also consider that the right patient not receiving the care activity that was intended for them in a timely fashion may also cause them harm too. So you can see why proper patient identification is a safety issue. The second outcome is unsatisfied patients. It's not surprising that getting the wrong care activity can cause patients and families to become upset and lose trust in our care. The third outcome from improper patient identification is wasted time. Wasted time for the right patient, wasted time for the wrong patient, and wasted time for all the healthcare providers involved in their care. A fourth outcome is cost. Delivering unnecessary care, whatever the intervention, is a total waste of money. A final outcome is that delivering the wrong care activity because we didn't properly identify a patient puts us and our organization at significant medical legal risk. I hope you'll agree that, for all of these reasons, it's important that we've got Mr. Right when it comes to patient identification. So now that we agree that proper patient identification is really important, let's talk about how we properly identify patients. For the conscious patient, the most obvious identifiers are the patient's first and last names, as well as their date of birth. Other acceptable identifiers include the patient's ID number and a photo ID. These work well for the patient who is conscious, for the unconscious patient, an accompanying individual such as a family member or police, as well as demographic information from a sending facility can also be used. Now we often stress the importance of having two patient identifiers. I think it's important to understand why this is the case. Let's start with the patient's name. For common names, it's not unusual for patients with the same or similar names to be on the same unit. Even less common names are not that unique. As it turns out, Anthony Crocco is not only a pediatrician in Ontario who likes sketchy EBM, but he's also a guy who does real estate in Florida. If you think your name is unique in the world, see what a quick Google search teaches you. The second most common patient identifier is date of birth. Now, did you know that around 23 million people share your birthday and the birthday of anyone you're caring for? Unfortunately, we cannot use date of birth alone for patient identification. The remaining patient identifiers are unique to a patient, but not easily memorized or depend on others, so should never be used alone. Now that we've got a list of acceptable patient identifiers, you may be wondering if there are identifiers that are not acceptable. The answer is, of course, yes. Firstly, it's not acceptable to use room or bed number as a patient identifier. It's far too easy for a patient to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Secondly, labeled clothing or equipment can easily be inadvertently used by another patient. We wouldn't want Mr. Wrong taken to the OR for a surgery he doesn't need because he borrowed Mr. Wright's house coat. Also, we shouldn't just ask patients, is your name Joe Smith, as a way of identifying. It's too easy for hearing or cognitive issues to confuse the process. Now that we know why proper patient identification is important and why we need two patient identifiers, you may be wondering when are the riskiest times for patient identification. As it turns out, there are at least four really risky times. The first risky time is when we are meeting a patient for the first time. Prior to that moment, they could be anyone in the world. It's important that we get proper patient identification correct right out of the gate. The second risky time is whenever a patient is getting any care activity. This could include things such as tests, treatments, procedures, medications, blood products, and even food. Also, involving and empowering patients and families in this process can safeguard the care we deliver. The third risky time is when we're transferring care of a patient to another healthcare provider. An example may include shift change. If we get patient identification wrong during handover, we're setting everyone up for a disaster. The last risky time is when we're transferring a patient to a new unit or ward. We are likely moving them from a location where they are well known to somewhere where nobody knows them at all. Making sure that new patients on a ward are properly identified is critical. At the end of the day, I think it's crucial to remember to always use two appropriate patient identifiers for safe care. 
Additionally, involving and empowering patients and families can safeguard this whole process. Lastly, proper patient identification is so important that Accreditation Canada has made it a required organizational practice. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Sketch EVM. Please do take the time to evaluate, and as always, remember to draw your own conclusions. <laughs>